I did. Uh, honest, uh, honest truth. I was like, you're dumb. You have no idea what you're talking about. First of all, I don't like people. I don't like being around people. I don't like talking in front of people. I don't like touching people. And you're calling me to do all these things, and on top of it, love these folk. And he was like, yeah, because it's no longer you. He showed me that night that everything Eli touched, Eli broke. And he showed me through deputation, through some of the trials we've already faced in such a young Christian life, some of the trials I've faced. Understand, I'm not going to name names. That's not who I'm here to do. That's between them and God. I've been told that I am not ready, that my marriage is not established. I haven't been saved long enough. I haven't held a title in a church, that I haven't graduated Bible college yet, because that's in the Bible. Um, <laughs> oh, here's another good one. Everybody loves this one. I can't hide it. You have holes in yours. What? I didn't know that. Thanks for telling me. I got told to quit deputation that I needed to go and sit under a pastor. Had I done that, I wouldn't have got to see the growth that's happened in my life and my family's life. I wouldn't have got to meet great people like you, like Brother Coons. I wouldn't have got to go to Heartland and see that magnificent thing. I wouldn't have got to go and have fun in the ministry and meet so many amazing people. That's what I was talking about earlier, guys. Always heed to the call of the Lord, not to the call of the world. Understand something, my soul got saved, not my flesh. Every, pa every pastor's soul got saved, not their flesh. What we think oftentimes in our opinion will cloud the judgment of what the call really is. I'm not saying buck your pastor, right? Don't do that. I wouldn't. I'm big. I, he's a big dude. I heard he does cartwheels. I don't. Not messing with that dude. But obey the Lord. We've been on deputation since September 5th of last year. We're at 67%. Wow. We're moving to New Mexico at the end of the summer to work with our Sending Church. We're actually helping them plant a church in Baird, and it's just great how the Lord's worked things out. I get to basically trial pastor a church for six months and help build that church and preach three times a week. Talk about training to go and pastor a church somewhere, hallelujah. I literally get to do it. The Lord's been good. What they saying, he's, tell me a time he's not been faithful. I can name a million times I haven't been faithful. But he's always been there. It's been magnificent. It's been so much fun. I want you all to understand something. I say it behind every pulpit, and I will get directly behind the pulpit. The guy you're going to listen to tonight, don't listen to me, listen to him. But the man up here delivering the gospel is the reason there's a passage in this Bible about the foolishness of preaching. I don't deserve to do this. There is no reason. I, it's in my message, but I'm going to say it right now. I guess I'm just going to obey the Lord. Oh, I've got to swipe. These things are too fancy for me. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Paul says he's the chief of the sinners. Could you imagine if his pastor would have told him to sit still and wait? You know what would have happened? We'd be missing close to half of our New Testament. But Paul knew the change. Paul knew as bad and as worthless as he was and what he did, he knew the change in his life that the Lord performed. And then he went about telling everybody about it, about it and wrote the better portion of our New Testament. That is what we get saved out of today. Don't ever, ever let someone tell you that you're not good enough. That you're not worthy. Yeah, I get, look. Look, the only reason I got an iPad is because I can't read my own handwriting. I ain't even had this thing a month and it's about to get broke. Like, it never listens to me. It just, it's a liberal. We don't know. <laughs> so, I was in the Navy. Look, all right, I'm allowed to do politics from the pulpit, but guess what you're not going to get from me? Politics from the pulpit because I don't care. Understand my heart whenever I say that I do care about our country and y'all are gonna hear it in a second Any veteran in here you can get mad at me if you want. We'll talk about it later. Um, I Thought I was serving my country in the United States military. I was a gas turbine mechanic I was visit board search and seizure qualified. I boarded Somalian pirate ships for an entire deployment Yeah, I came back a little messed up, but can I tell you how great our Lord is? I don't take a pill to go to sleep I don't take a pill to calm myself down and have a wife for that that's what our God does, but he has now placed in my family's life 
We are missionaries to Raton, New Mexico, which if anyone here is hunters, anyone here a hunter? Give me a call. I've got a guided elk hunter, uh, a, a guided tour guy for elk in Raton. So if anyone wants to come shoot a giant horse deer, that's what I call them when we almost hit them. Come on through. So we're going to see if the clicker works. I bet it will. Oh, what's up? New Mexico is the fifth, sorry, look, understand something guys, I got three teenage daughters, one eight-year-old boy and one almost two-year-old boy that I'm pretty sure has the mental capacity of a 35-year-old. <laughs> I'm dead serious, it's weird, we pull up to a drive through and like she's asking everyone what they want and like you hear squishy in the back, Coke, I'm like, dude, you're not even two, <laughs> like come on bro, like fix your face. New Mexico is the fifth largest state in the United States by land area. Did you know, fun fact, New Mexico is a state in the United States? I got asked by someone in the United States Navy from Buffalo, New York, if I joined the military. Oh, dude, you scared me for a second. I was like, get him off. I was like, I don't know. I'll leave my man, my bad. All right, good night. Flashback to the Navy story now, after your pastor tried to get real. I thought I was getting knocked off, like he's got someone somewhere with a 50 cal, like game over. I got asked by this girl that graduated high school in New York, right, the Mecca, like, oh, everyone in New York's the best. She said, did you join the Navy to get your citizenship? I'm a six foot three white dude. Yeah, I speak no Spanish. I can ask you where the bathroom is, and like, I can order things off a menu. That's about the extent of that. I was like, absolutely, that's why I joined. Well, lo and behold, whenever I surrendered my call to the mission field, this is the best story I've got ever about disobeying God, right? It wasn't even a disobedience. It was just me being big-headed and prideful and egotistical. I submitted my call last February, not this past February, the February before, and I submitted to the Southwest. Then one night I just got under conviction, great meeting. I didn't know what was going on. I was like, dude, am I not saved? Like, this is the third time this has happened. What's going on? Well, I went down to the altar and I just gave it all to the Lord. I said, God, I'm yours. Whatever you need, whatever you want for me, my life is yours. I'll do whatever you'll, ha you'll have me do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. But I will not go back to New Mexico. You'll see that yellow thing with the red thing in the middle. Take a close look at it. That's the New Mexico state flag. Because I'm now a missionary to the state of New Mexico. I grew up there, right? I got to see it. Why did I press that? Y'all don't need to see that yet. Unless you like green chilies, then you do that's hatch. That's where they grow them. Amen. Well, 2.1 million people in the entire state of New Mexico, 31 independent fundamental Baptist churches. When we did the, now I'm going to look at her a lot because she's way better with statistics. I'm like, boom, she's like, yeah. When we did the full Southwest, we cut the bottom halves of Utah and Colorado. We brought that into it. Entire state of Arizona, New Mexico, some of Oklahoma and half of Texas, 50.1 million people a little over 1,000 independent fundamental Baptist churches. There's over 500 in the state of North Carolina alone. It's not good numbers. A lot of souls are lost and dying and going to hell in our backyard. That's what I was going with earlier. I thought I was serving my country whenever I was fighting for it. Now I actually get to go to war for my country with a weapon. Yes, sir that's for the greater good. I actually get to serve my country as a servant now, not sorry everybody, I'm apologizing now, I've been trying not to do this, but I mind the Lord to not no longer be a bully for America, but to be a servant for America. And I get to see that everywhere I go and I'm like, man, yeah, I said it in a room full of veterans. Yeah, we're bullies. <laughs> we are. What happens? You mess with us, we turn you into a parking lot. Hatch has 1,648 people, no churches at all, not a single church. See that house right there boarded up? We watched a family walk out of that house. People live in this. 
Y'all are going to see a lot of pictures that look like this. I promise you, it's all over New Mexico. I went overseas. It looks like a third world country. Cloudcroft. If you ever get a chance to go to Cloudcroft, New Mexico, do it. Every woman in here during Christmas time watches Hallmark Channel. Yeah, don't lie. I watch it too. You pull up into this place, like it was 110 degrees where we were in New Mexico. You go up there, it was like 67. Beautiful Hallmark movie, like cabins everywhere. Just And this is just in the town. The outskirts, disgusting. Just, you'll see a couple pictures. We went in. Oh, yeah, it's a Mecca, by the way, 713 people. Doesn't sound like a lot until you try and put those 713 in this church. That's a lot of souls. No church whatsoever. We went. Nicole, Alyssa, and I went into a turquoise shop to look at rings because they're dirt cheap there. And I'm like, that's cool, and I love my kids, so let's do it. The lady brought out rings. One of them said John 3.16 on it. I was like, that's what I'm talking about. Amen. That girl looked us dead in our eyes. Y'all had to hear this. Y'all don't hear a lot of repeats. It's what you get for letting us stay at y'all's house. Hallelujah. She said, man, everyone loves that because of that country song. Mm most famous verse in the entire universe wow. and our own backyard doesn't know other than from a country song when I was selling drugs doing drugs partying I knew John 316 verbatim our country's gone downhill yes, sir. and understand my heart I love overseas I've been there I know the need how can we send people out of a country that we can't even take care of it hurts. Our country was founded on God, and now it's being ran by gold. That right there is what people live in. The outskirts of Cloudcroft. My brother played his state football game there, and I loved it. I was like, man, it's pretty. We went back, and it's dying. The entire nation is. Don't worry. We'll wait. Alan will go. Oh, come on. It's my fault. Don't blame the people up there. Can y'all go back a slide? Because I can't, apparently. Alamogordo, New Mexico. That is where White Sands is. That's where they tested the atomic bombs. Los Alamos is where all the scientists live. That's where they build them. <laughs> per square foot, I believe, and per capita, there are more doctorates than any other city and state in America in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Alamogordo has a military base. Look at this, though. Look at the numbers. Right outside of Alamogordo is the other place I was praying for. It's Tularosa. It's got a 1,300 population, I believe. 23, 27, 328,000. 26. Amen. 2,600. So you're looking at over 70,000 people within a 15-minute radius, right? We can drive that to Independent Fundamental Baptist Churches. Those are not good odds. And I guess you're clicking there. Hey, more houses. That's what you're going to see. Sorry, I'm not this big elaborate guy that wants to go out and like take videos of poor people, right? Like, I think that's rude. I was like, if someone would have asked to do that with me in Walmart's parking lot, you're liable to get punched in the face, right? I didn't want to get punched in the face this day. I was trying not to, so... People live in that. That's what we're seeing. Our beautiful nation should not be looking like a third world country. It shouldn't, guys. Like Everyone says, well, oh, well, you'll see it in a later slide in some of the other vision the Lord's given us in our lives and what we're going to, like, what, if he'll allow it, what we want to do in return. You can't just blame this on poverty. This is a lack of the gospel. This is what happens when there's no love. Yeah. When there's no more care, when there's no giving, the Bible plainly states that some of the, ch the people that are like, I'm a paraphraser, so sorry, I'm not going to quote scripture, I already told Brother Kuhn, so I just like, I try and memorize verses and I just, I can't, I'm still working on it, it's not doing very well. The Bible talks about how he loves those that will give to the poor and how the poor normally will go in first, amen, but just, just click. Santa Rosa was my rival in football. Evil people. No, y'all laugh. They put a pipe bomb under our bus. Oh, now it's okay to call them evil. But they were. Yeah, they did. And it was their parents. It was the parents of the school. But 2,600 people, no independent fundamental Baptist, King James Version, Bible reading, 
gospel-breathing churches. It's a beautiful little town. We went there. I was real upset then. Like, the Lord convicted me in Santa Rosa. I was like, nah, I'm not going back. I, like, I love you. And I didn't tell him this. I thought it, so he knew anyways. But I was like, you can't send a Texaco Wolverine to Santa Rosa. <laughs> like, I'm telling you, like, my church will get shot up. We can't do that. But he did break my heart for it. it is, it's depressing to see everyone. Like, y'all have never heard of the blue hole, have you? It's exactly what it is, the blue hole. It's that little water thing right there. We went, we swam in it. It's the, it stays 68 degrees year round. Like it never changes. You jump into it, your feet tingle. It's crazy. But it's got so much going for it. It does. There's so much opportunity in the state. People just aren't trying. People are used to the norm. They're used to the poor. They're used to cartel running 98% of everything. They're used to living life like this, but they still love America. If only we could show them who loved America first, Amen. Wow. the reason America's here, yeah. maybe they'd understand that there's still something worth fighting for. I understand my heart when I say this, one of the people that I pray for every single night is Joe Biden. Amen. I do. I'm as Republican as they come from what I've been told. I don't, I don't know. But you still got to pray for everybody. And this is my one political thing that I say, and I say it everywhere. I don't care if you're left wing or right wing. It's the same bird it's flying on. It is. Our government's corrupt regardless. Y'all all, a lot of y'all have worked for it, you know. Portales, New Mexico. I have to read the sign now everywhere because I didn't even notice it until we went to a church. Home of 12,000 friendly faces and three or four old grouches. <laughs> That's as soon as you drive into the city. Hallelujah. But they do. They've got a population probably closer now to 20,000. Uh, they've got Eastern New Mexico University. Nice little town. Uh, Sunland Peanuts. Big there. It's great. Good peanuts. Whatever. Y'all don't seem excited. I was excited. One KJV church. They're not reaching all 20,000 people. Y'all see the trend here. It's depressing. That's what Portales looks like. Wow, it's weird how they all look the same. Yeah, it does because New Mexico looks the same. <laughs> Everywhere you go, this is my home, just so everyone is aware, right here, this right here, this pretty little sign, welcome to Texaco, New Mexico, it is not a gas station. <laughs> it's an ICO, not an ACO, come on, it's, it's for real, population of 1,096 in Texaco and 48,186 in Clovis, there's two really good works in Clovis, there could be another one. There's almost 50,000 people in that city. They need more. I don't, I, don't, I don't believe in the whole we should fight between churches. Oh, you're coming to steal my members. No, we should work together. Amen. Like you and Brother Windu, hallelujah. Love that guy. In case y'all can't realize, but I talk about as much as Brother Windu does. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, that's real laughter right there. I heard it. They're like, I'm scared to laugh because he's a pastor too, but it's true. Texaco has no KJV church and over a thousand people. It's sad. It's dying. This house right here, one of my best friends in high school, his name is Lucas Walters, grew up there. It didn't look like that whenever we lived there. It's dying. And then, welcome home. This is Raton, New Mexico. See the cool little sign? It's real fancy. It lights up. Woo! Population, 5,802. That has grown a little bit. It's at about 6,200 now. Uh, no KJV church at all. There were a few good churches, it seemed, there that had some really good women pastors. Hallelujah. Um, they're doing good things, I guess, for the community. I don't know. There's so much potential here. When we went, the Lord just, like, as soon as we pulled into Raton, this is how I knew, right? You're like, did the Lord tell you? No, I stopped hearing voices a long time ago. <laughs> Thank you, someone. Good night. Like, he's y'all's pastor, and y'all are this tough? No, something's wrong. Y'all are lying about something. Something's going on here. But every person we talked to was just so loving and so susceptible and excited to hear that the Lord's sending someone. We pulled in, we drove up to the hotel, and a piece fell over our van. I don't, I, like I'm telling you, I don't know what it was. Like I knew everyone in the van had peace, but I was still just like, it can't be, I don't know. And like, 
Nicole, somehow my wife knows before me, like I swear she's the preacher and I'm just like the microphone for real. Like, I don't know, her discernment is just off the charts and I'm like, oh, they're bad people, well, I love them. And then they steal from you, right? Like, I don't know. But it's just wild. Like, she's great at reading people and understanding. Like, she knew that I had peace before I knew that I had peace. And I'm like, that's great. And even better, everyone, she won't tell me. Like, I get frustrated at her. I was like, just tell me. And she's like, but then it's from me and not from God. And then God tells me. And I'm like, why wouldn't you tell me? I already knew. It's so much fun. But it is. It's a beautiful little town. We've actually talked to, we got a number from one lady. We went to K-Bob's and ate. The waitress there was excited and gave us the piece of paper that they were rebuilding Raton. That was the name of it. They are having a city council meeting. At the top of the list of items they were going to talk about was cannabis shops. Right? Because that's what's going to rebuild our nation is marijuana. Wrong Mary. Oh, come on. That was good. Amen. But it's the truth. They think that the money that's going to come from pot is going to boost this town. And you're right. The money could, except for the fact when you go to towns where it's been legal and everyone's like, well, Colorado's doing great. Yeah, except crime is way up. They just refuse to tell you. And homeless is way up because now they've got these addictions. No one wants to go to work because of the stimulus check. Yeah, I said it. And now they're stealing and committing crimes to try and support their addictions. So just how great is this miracle plan? It's not. Like, I'm going to tell you right now, Moses was not high when he talked to the burning bush. I don't think he was smoking it either. I don't. Amen. You can, thank you. Thank you. I, I do comedy in my side. Apparently, I need to quit that and just stick with preaching. Like, that was the hardest eye roll I've ever been given by my, life, by, by my wife. I was like, yeah, I'm going to hear about this when we leave. <laughs> but seriously, guys, this is the truth. Like, this is, y'all think I was joking. Everything looks exactly the same because every town you go to, they're all looking for something and they don't know what it is. You start loving on these people, though, and they're so susceptible. Whenever they realize that, you know, you're not going to bark at them because they're talking to you or because they're clothes or some type of way, I'm going to tell y'all right now, chastise me if you want like I said it's between him and I I don't dress like this everywhere I go I'm sorry I cannot work out in slacks y'all are lucky I'm walking this much I'm scared I'm gonna rip my suit that's how it goes I saw you looking at me and I was sitting there they're like they probably think I'm awkward like if I move the wrong way we're popping a scene it's just how it, it's how it is I've ripped one jacket ripped a shirt this shirt I'm wearing under here ripped whatever it happens these people deserve love as well. Yes, sir, sir. Amen. I come from a place, and that's why I've realized now that the Lord gave me the testimony that he gave me, because a lot of these people are living in drugs and sin and alcohol and abuse and poverty, and it's because they don't know. It's not that they don't want to know. They've never heard it. How, how? How can you get saved unless you hear it? And how is a lot of people, and this is something that one of the most wise people in the room told me, sometimes we're the only Bible that people get to read. I feel like how we are as a family and how we act is probably going to draw more people in than if I was to just go and give, and I'm still going to do John Romans, I'm still going to go soul winning, I'm still going to have tracks, but talking to people like they're people goes a real long way. You know how I know? Because she talked to me like I was a person. And now, the other ministry visions, this is where stuff starts getting even more serious, and I will not joke as much because you are starting to scare me. <laughs> New Mexico alone aborts about 7,000 babies a year. Mm, yeah, I told you things were getting serious. They have no limit on age until the, of the baby being aborted up until right before the delivery. Think about that. Those are tiny people that they're just taking their lives of, it's the mom's choice. What about the baby's choice? How about we let that baby come out, grow a little bit, and let the mom tell him what was going to happen, and then let that baby make the choice, right? Oh, that's murder. Are you kidding me? If it's got a heartbeat, it's murder. 49% of abortion patients live below poverty. New Mexico's third highest poverty rate in America. 
It's got so much potential, everybody. Understand, when I got to see it through a Christian's eyes, oh my goodness, New Mexico is so beautiful. Everywhere you go, there's something magnificent. Like, I get excited to see cacti now. Never thought I'd see the day. I'm like, look at that cactus, it's so cool. But it is, it's just, and like, it's because I get to see it and I know who grew that cactus. Because only God can make things appear in the desert that need water. That's an amen moment. Thank you. You got, an, you got to tell them to amen. I see that now. We got you. 20 abortion clinics in New Mexico, five pregnancy help centers. Understand, every state surrounding New Mexico allows, New Mexico allows those people to come in and abort their babies, especially if they have a law against it. It's bad. It is truly bad. Now to my teenagers. Over 50% of pregnancies are to unwed mothers. 1,500 pregnancies a year belong to 15 to 19 year olds. You don't want to solve that? Sitting right where you're sitting and soaking up what the preacher's got to say. You want to solve unwed babies? You want to solve babies being born early at young ages? The gospel. That's how that happens. Uh, I believe we looked up the statistic. I don't know if it's on the next one. We'll see. Nope. Uh, I think it was like 75% of the 15 to 19 year olds that abort their babies abort them because they already have a child. It's not, not the way that our nation should be going with things. And the reason I say our nation is because it is understand the Great Commission was given to each one of y'all sitting in this room right now. It starts here. I wasn't called to reach the uttermost or the outermost parts of that or whatever. Like I said, I butcher everything, so I don't try to quote it anymore. The, uh, yeah, those, the outmost, whatever, way, way yonder, southeastern scripture, yonder. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm called to New Mexico. Y'all are called to Jefferson City. Maybe there's a missionary in here called somewhere else. Hallelujah. But we can all do something to help. We do. The Lord's given us the vision for a pregnancy help center. And along with this pregnancy help center, we want to kind of do a young single mothers that have gone through addiction and, and bad relationships, basically be a safe haven for these women so they can learn budgets, so they can learn the gospel, so they can not wonder about where their kids are when they do try and work and do better. There's going to be stipulations, understand, drug tests and all that fun stuff is going to be required but not because we don't trust them, but because we want to see them succeed. We want one day for maybe that dad of that child that may have been abusive or aiding the drugs, the day that that man walks into church, it's all worth it. That's the stuff that we want to see. We've got to see it happen in Georgia already, and that put the vision in our life. I was like, Lord, we got 50, 11 kids as it is, and you want us to go help in these other families? And he said, yep, and we said, okay. And now we've got to watch that flourish. And it's so amazing. It's so beautiful to see. And the Lord's given us that vision. But right there, the end of it is what it's all about, is that we can see souls saved and families helped. That's what this call is all about. And understand something. I know that he said missionary family, and I know that I'm the missionary. I want each one of y'all, if y'all could, whenever y'all leave tonight, shake each one of their hands because they're all missionaries as well. They back me just as much as anybody. And they're stuck in a car with me for numerous hours. Yeah, y'all get my horrible jokes for like an hour and a half. They get it for 30. Mm, yeah, everyone's sad for them now. The United States is wealthy in sin, but poor in the gospel. We're burdened for Raton and the souls that need the Lord. I understand something. Y'all's pastor said it, and I believe that's the last slide. You can cut it off. That's magnificent. Yeah, it's the last slide. You're good. I'm going to get real heartfelt for a second. Y'all helped a lot at Heartland understand something. I was not supposed to present. I got told by a pastor in Santa Fe and by my wife's cousin's husband, who is a pastor in Edmond, Oklahoma. They both told me, look, you're not a Heartland grad. It's your first time going to the meeting. Just soak it in. You're not going to do anything. They'll call you up at the end. They'll give you a little love offering. But network. First morning, not first night, first morning, second group of missionaries, my name got called. If you see this awesome dent in my Bible spine, you see that divot? Yeah, that's nerves with me squeezing my Bible on the stage. 
Yeah, about 1,100 preachers in there that I have to present in front of that I'm not prepared to present in front of. I presented the need for 20000 for us to start just for startup costs. My, the big dummy, here we go. Didn't even talk about the support level we were at. My full-time deputation said nothing about support. I'm an idiot. But we did. Y'all's church helped. I don't remember how much it was. Like, look, after I presented, like, my heart stopped for a minute. I don't know what happened. I, like, the Lord completely took over. I didn't know where I was. And then people just started popping up. $13,515 was raised for startup calls for our church. That's God. And my presentation was probably the shortest one at Heartland because I was so scared I didn't know what to do. Uh, that meant the world to us. Like I said, we're at 67%. We'd like to be at 80% before we go to New Mexico. We're leaving. We're moving at the end of the summer. God's told us to. He'll provide. I know he will. But I thank you all for the opportunity. I thank you for allowing me to present. And I thank you for your love and your commitment to the gospel. And to helping the church planners. Y'all don't understand. And I know y'all pray, but I'm going to ask y'all to pray for us. We need it. Everyone thinks, oh, you need money to start a church. What? Really? No way. I didn't know that. You know what starts churches first? Prayer. I can do nothing without it. I, apparently, sometimes I can't do nothing with it, but it reaches way more than a dollar ever will. I know there's going to be a lot of people that are passing me in line when I'm standing up there. I don't know how it's going to go, right? Everyone talks about a line. I don't think there's going to be a line. It's God. I don't think there's like weird self-checkouts up there, right? Like, I think we're up there, we talk, well, he talks, we probably cry, and then you're rejoicing. And your mansion that hopefully has a queso fountain. <laughs> this guy. Yeah. Boom. Right? Wouldn't that be phenomenal? But if there is a line, I know that there's going to be some people that are passing, and I'm like, who is that? And I'm like, oh, that's that old lady from that church who presented that that prayed for you. Prayer warriors, keep on praying. It means the world. Well, now that I've completely made a fool of myself and my family, you're welcome. Uh, I would like to give y'all what the Lord's given me. And understand, I normally, old Eli didn't preach like this, but uh, I hope illustrations are cool with you because it's going to happen regardless. If you would, <laughs> yeah, laughter, amen, have fun, youth. Have fun in the ministry understand something i don't think that all the disciples walked around all doom and gloom other than the time like when they did because jesus had been crucified right that's the one time they talk about it every other time it seems like they're pretty like for goodness sake i'm gonna preach it in a second but like paul was happy in prison like we're miserable in like our nice three pieces and fancy dress shoes that look like you could dance in a bar amen but these guys walked around in like flip-flops and beat up robes. Other than Peter, who occasionally wore nothing. <laughs> it says it, it's scripture. Hallelujah. Am I, am I the only one that remembers that when Jesus came onto the boat and Peter had to put on his robe and then he jumped into the water? Like, <laughs> Peter, you're an idiot. But me and Peter got a lot in common, right? He was a sailor, I was a sailor. If you would, turn with me. There's more laughter. Now you're getting it. There we go. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 18. Like I said, this scripture, guys, I wasn't... Actually, I had this message written out already. And last night in Brother Coon's basement, I went down after talking to him for a little bit and just fellowshipping and just loving on the Lord some. I went down. I was like, I got to get a message ready. The Lord was like, no, you're preaching this. I said, hey amen, it's already prepared. He said, but you're doing different scripture and you have to change everything in it. And I was like, so I'm not going back upstairs and telling him good night. And the Lord said, nope. I said, okay. But we're reading six verses. Uh, if you are willing and able, if you could stand in reference to the word, please do. The Bible says in chapter 18, starting in verse 1, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again 
another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my, mine hand, O house of Israel. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this evening, God. We thank you for loving us, Father. We thank you for the blessings you bestow upon us each and every day, Lord. We thank you for giving another breath in our lungs, Lord, to serve and worship you, Father. We pray now, Lord, that uh, you would hide me behind the cross, Father, that you would empty me of all the things of this world, Lord, and just fill me with the Spirit, Father, and just, just unload more blessings upon each one of us, Lord, that we could all reap from this, Father, and, and leave here a changed being, Lord, and really be able to chew on the meat, Lord, that you've given, Father. And if, they're not, if someone's here that's not saved, Lord, that you would speak to their heart, Lord, and let them know that it's the greatest time of their life, Lord, and they'll never regret it, Father. And through it all, we'll be mindful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in your most precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. And you can be seated. Like I said, real familiar scripture. I references, referenced it earlier. This is what I got saved out of. This, this exact scripture, it means the world to me. Where we're at today in our society, the world is overrun with sin. The glorification of sin actually, and the condemnation of those that love Christ. It happens. That's, that's where we go, everywhere we go. People know that my kids are church singers, and my wife's a church singer, and I'm a preacher, I'm a missionary, and it's like that's a bad thing. People like to turn their nose up to it, and I do understand because there are a bunch of churches and a bunch of people that act like if you're a sinner, you shouldn't be in church because you're better than me. Like I said earlier, 1 Timothy, Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. This is where sinners need to be. This is not a nightclub for the righteous. This is a red cross for the lost. That's what we should have coming in. I use this illustration quite often. If anyone in here is a fisherman, you will understand. Does anyone in here fish? This is the issue that a lot of people in churches are having. And I like to tell a bunch of people in the southeast, the next time you go fishing... Stick your knife in the water and clean the fish before you catch it. And let me know how many fish you catch. Oftentimes we forget where God's brought us from and we want them to come in walking and talking and looking and acting like Christians and we forget that we're still a sinner. I'm thankful today that I met the one who could fill every single void that I've ever tried to fill with the things of this world. The problem with the things of this world, now this is directly pointed at all young people. I know you play sports. A lot of y'all probably do. This is where we shake heads. That is a great thing. Do not let the world get a hold of you. Take Christ with you when you're playing. I said this actually to Pastor Nolan's son the other night, and I'm going to say it to each of you. I don't wish a loss on anybody. If there comes a time that you lose a football game, take your helmet off, bow your head, and pray, and thank God for giving you the ability to play. That's where people see a difference. That's when you're the only Bible some people get to read. Take loss and failure as growth. Never take it as, oh, it's doom and gloom into the world. I don't like losing either, trust me. So the Lord put me in a new world of sports called Strongman where I do nothing but fail. And it's the truth, but I get to grow every single day. And for those of y'all that don't think Strongman's biblical, he moved the first Atlas stone, so I'm just saying. <laughs> I, there we go, I got one. The first thing that I want us all to see in the scripture, and it, it, it talks about the potters making something, right? Normally potters make pots, <laughs> vases, cups. For the sake of the message, we're going to say vessels. A water bottle is nothing but a vessel for water. Can we, can we agree on that point? We are nothing but vessels for a very real soul. I don't use weird things that some people say. I'm not going to call it like a, a flesh suit or anything like that. That's disgusting. We are a vessel for a soul. That's what sets us apart from animals. Yeah, I said it. I know it makes no sense. We have souls. 
Yes, Kirsten, I said it. Your animals that you love dearly do not have souls. <laughs> Sorry, honey. I can't tell you that all dogs go to heaven. <laughs> Understand this, though. Like I said, we're nothing more than a vessel. The world wants to take everything your vessel has to offer away from you. I know a lot of people don't want to believe it. They're like, oh, you're telling me that all these superstars on TV that want what's best for me, want what's worse for me? Absolutely. That's why you still see superstars commit suicide, because they still have a void. There comes a time to where you can do no more with your vessel. The world's already taken everything you have to offer. And then they crumple you up and throw you to the side. You know how I know? I lived the fast life. We've been over this. When I had nothing left to give, no one was there for me. When I was sleeping in Walmart's parking lot, they threw my vessel to the side, left it empty and crumpled, and ultimately looking like trash and useless, right? This is what the world does with a bottle. But... Oh, everyone's like, oh, it's a sad message. No, this is one of the most encouraging messages I hope you ever hear. Because that's what the world sees. You know what God sees? He sees a beautiful vessel. God does not care what your bottle looks like. He doesn't care where your bottle's been. He doesn't care who else's hands your bottle's been in. He cares about what he can do with that vessel. You know how I know verse 6 says, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. Mm. Isn't it nice to know that as a saved person, we're in the hands of the one that created it all? Lost person, if you are here tonight, understand God is not going to judge you on the look of your bottle. He does not. Once you get saved, there's something great that happens. Every sin is forgiven and forgotten. This world doesn't forget anything, but God does. That's how amazing he is. And he's a God of absolutes. He absolutely forgets what your sin was. Which boggles my mind because of how horrible of a person I was. When we give our bottles to God, this is after salvation. We receive many, many amazing things. The first thing you receive, mm, this one's a good one. Buckle up. He forgives you. Mm. As a lost person, I know it because I lived it. We all feel worthless and useless and just beat down and burdened. And oh, I wanted to end it all. I was like, there's absolutely zero purpose left in my life. Like I've said a million times, you're probably going to hear it a million other. God doesn't care. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ didn't just die for the Calvinist few. Yeah, I said Calvin is behind the bullpit. Yeah, it happens. He died for every sinner's sin. Every single sin you ever had before you could even think or act. You're like, oh, I wasn't that bad as a kid. Yeah, you were. You know how I know? Because the Lord has showed me. I was like, I wasn't that bad of a kid. Now I have five. I was horrible. He died for those sins, even as a little kid. He died for Hitler's sins. Yeah. Put that into perspective, people. He died for Adolf Hitler's sins. Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden. He died for each one of their sins. What makes you think he didn't die for yours? And he forgives you. He wants you to give it, give, yes, that's where I was going with that. that whoo. I get spaced out. I'm a rabbit chaser, so deal with it. But he does. He forgives your sin, and also, like I said earlier, he doesn't care what it looks like or what it's got left. He just wants you to give him what you do have left. No matter what we think can be done or cannot be done with it, he will use for a greater good. We see that time and time again in our Bible. I've seen it time and time again in my life. Someone that should have wound up in life in prison or dead or any of the other things that could have happened to me. The Lord loved me so much. Even whenever I was living the life that I lived, he had a weird plan already going on for me to meet that woman right there. 
Everything happens for a reason. I know that's a very, very broad expression, but it truly does. Well, here's the fun time. Here we go. And of course, my thing's not going to work. Well, so we've been forgiven. John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, after you've been forgiven, and understand this all happens at the altar the time you get saved, boom, it happens, he fills you. So you go from being a crumpled up nothing to all of a sudden forgiven, and then the Holy Spirit enters your body. Mmm. Isn't that amazing? Something that I want y'all to understand. You can't see it. I wasn't going to walk down. I didn't know y'all had 812 steps. You could have told me that. I told you I was a strong man, not a CrossFitter. Amen. But I am going to walk over and ask him, though. So see, it looks like a bottle again, right? But when you get real close, you see the scars, little deformations in there, right? He cleanses you and he fills you but he's not going to take away the memory of your past. The scars are still there, but all of a sudden your vessel looks usable again, right? There was a scripture that I had in my heart, and at first I was like, Lord, this doesn't go anything with my message. And he said, how about you write it down and study it, and we'll talk about it. In John 1. Nope, back up. John 2. That's a different scripture. In John 2, we all know the wedding of Cana. Jesus turned water into wine, right? Great miracle. But before every miracle, something has to happen. Understand that. Now see if y'all can decide for this right here. John 2, 7. And he saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. The Lord can't do anything with something that's empty. That miracle had to be performed with filled vessels. When you get saved, I know it looks empty, But check this out. The world can't crumple you back up and throw you away. Because you're full of the Holy Spirit. He can use you. Your vessel has a purpose again. Mm. After he fills you, he takes all those empty spots. You know those voids that we tried for so long to fill with the things of this world. And the spirit reaches way deeper than any substance ever could. The spirit can fill spots of the tiniest that we didn't even know were there. But if we keep feeding them, they grow really, really big. But because of who he is and what he does in your life, whenever you're saved and you get changed, no one can take him away from you. It never leaves you. People leave you. I will fail you. Kids, I will fail you. Bless you, that was gross. I will fail you. Our Lord and Savior will not fail you. Another wise thing that I was told from that beautiful woman sitting down there, she said, your worst day lost is still better than your best day saved. I didn't know what that meant until I had a bad day as a saved person. And whenever I woke up the next day, guess what? I didn't have a hangover. A lot of the problem was gone because I gave it to God and I could smile. My worst day saved is still better than my best day lost every single day. Never changes. Well, what happens after he fills you, right? Everyone sees the impurity still. Everyone sees the old you. No one wants to believe the change. Well, hallelujah that our Lord fixes things, right? We've heard he forgives you, he fills you. And he fixes you. He takes the things that were deemed broken and out of commission and put it all back together. And then commissions it for a greater purpose to serve him and to win others so they can ultimately go through his recycling process. I was going to title this, and then I realized how horrible it sounded, so I didn't. But I feel like y'all will probably laugh at it because y'all seem to be a lot like me. I was going to put our Lord as a tree hugger. But... Right? But ultimately then I thought about Calvary and I was like, that's horrible. I shouldn't put that. So I put recycled bottles. Hallelujah. But it does. Just like the potter and his clay, that's what we see. The potter didn't throw the clay away. 
He kept it on that will. Yes, sometimes you get beaten down and broken down, and it's because as a father, he cares, and he will chastise you, and he has to let you know when you're doing wrong. But oh my, when he builds you back up. Mm. The great things that I've got to see that happen, even through some of my worst trials because I am stubborn and don't listen. Yeah, I saw your little half smile. You tried to hide it. Yeah, it's there. But we see it right here. The potter didn't take it off the wheel. He kept it. He broke it down. He beat it. Ultimately, until he formed it into something that in his eyes was perfect. That's what God does to us. Each day I get to wake up and I get to grow. I get to change and I get to remember that at one point in my life, my bottle was crumpled up and had no use for it at all. Until Jesus stepped in. Once Jesus stepped in and got a hold of it, this is the only time I ever compliment myself behind a pulpit. But in his eyes, I'm beautiful. In my wife's eyes, I'm beautiful. My kids' eyes, I'm crazy. <laughs> I got sorry. I got like three and a half laughs on that. Thanks, guys. <laughs> People always, uh, I love scripture, I love scripture that shows the truth and what the gospel does in people's lives. I don't know if I already told you this story, but because of the sake of everything, I have to use it. I don't like calling him, I heard this at a missions conference, I don't like calling him the maniac of Gadara. I don't, because we see the change in his life. So, a man took it upon himself to rename him, and I love it, and I'm keeping it, so his name is Manny. Amen. I like it, right? People are like, oh, well, we see a little bit of a change in your life. Oh, no, no, no. This is not about Eli. There have been changes in everyone's life throughout the Bible. We see it in the maniac of Gadara, a.k.a. Manny. The woman with the issue of blood that no doctor could fix. Ooh, but Jesus stepped in and it got fixed, right? What about the sick of palsy that couldn't walk? That his friends brought him and lowered him down through the roof. Yeah, he got fixed, but you know what happens through all of it that everyone always overlooks? We want to talk about the outward miracle. He always forgives them of their sin first. People are like, well, the woman of the issue of blood, that didn't happen until he turned and said, no, because Jesus is also 100% God. He could perceive in his heart what's going on in other people's heart. And I do truly believe that her sin was forgiven before he found her. He knew who she was already. He just wanted to see if she had the faith to come and tell him. And she did. That's what we all get to see. That's the same God that we serve today. That's the same miracle that you can all see. I've got to use the scripture that my brother told me. It was John 12. It wasn't John 12. Amen. We always overlook it. Everyone wants to talk about the raising of Lazarus. How about let's look back? And he does. A lot of people came to see Lazarus, but it wasn't because of his miracle that happened to him. It was because of what he did with his second chance. I pray every single day that I don't ruin my second chance that he gave me. Because if I do mess it up, I know what he's going to do with it. He's taking me out. That's real morbid, but I'm a Baptist. We all are. We're like, the worst thing that can happen to us is death, and I'm ready to die. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not ready to die. I'm not. There's too many souls in this United States that need the gospel. There's too many kids that I need to watch grow up and see what the Lord does in their lives. All because he took my crumpled, trashy, worthless bottle that should have been thrown away and just left out. And he recycled it to be used. That's what each one of us are granted through salvation. Everybody can have this. This is not some weird magic trick that only a few people get. All you have to do is ask him. That goes along with everything in my last points. The last things that we see, once we're saved... Once we start getting filled with the Spirit, boom, abundant blessings. That's where everyone gets happy. Why are you not happy? Amen. Be excited. It's like, man, the Lord just changed me from this worthless being that deserved nothing that met this gorgeous woman when he looked like a crackhead weighing 205 pounds, shouldn't be doing anything for God. And has now filled me up not only with the southern woman's cooking, but with the gospel. 
I went from 205, thought that I was the prettiest thing in the world, to I feel so gorgeous right now with a slender 350. Why? Because it's God's 350 pounds. It's no longer Eli's 350 pounds. <laughs> Call me obese if you want to. I'm happy and fat. We do get abundant blessings. I know my face doesn't portray it. You know how I know my face does not portray it? Because my wife tells me every single day that I do not look like I exude joy because of my face. Look at this happiness. <laughs> yeah, y'all get me. I'm so happy on the inside, apparently. I'm working on it, and she's tired of hearing this behind the pulpit because I think she thinks I'm lying, but I really am working on it. But we do. Well, the first blessing we get, we all get endless joy. Here's the thing. I said it earlier. The things of the world that we think brings us happiness goes away. Understand something. If you're a sinner, if you're lost, well, we're all sinners. I didn't mean to start with that. I meant to say if you're saved or if you're not, but hallelujah. If you're lost or if you're saved right now, we all know we mess up. You know, the great thing about being saved, I said it earlier, when we mess up, the next day we wake up, we ask forgiveness. Paul says, I crucify the flesh daily. It means you have to pray daily and ask for forgiveness. You know, the, mm, what gets me every single day is that I can wake up from something as great as this, still tired, but I have no hangover. I, have, I can go to work. I can still do for God. Amen. And my money is still there for the most part, other than feeding the family at 18,000. I wish that I had that ability to break the fish into feeding, I don't know how many it was, 5,000 men, but I do not. But we do. We get so much joy. Yes, joy. Rainbows and butterflies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People don't believe that you can have fun in the ministry. You know how I can prove it? Because I've got five, well, right now, four kids sitting right there that can contest, uh, for the most part, having fun on 34-hour trips across America to go to California. Yeah, I told y'all my wife was super spiritual. She drives straight, no stops, other than bathroom breaks and occasionally food if she is hungry. Or the kids are awake. If not, we starving. But we have fun. I tell you right now, I thought the day that I got to put on that, I'm talking to you, yeah, stop biting your hand. <laughs> God, that was such an awkward moment for me to talk to it. Oh, man. Great day. Well, you'll get to, you haven't put on your championship ring yet, right? It's, it's so awesome, right? Just you feel, woo, on top of the world. Can I tell you right now, this right here trumps that. Standing behind a pulpit all over the United States trumps anything. Brother, I got to show you, I showed you a couple videos. Standing in front of like, you know, 100 people at some of the competitions that I get to do. Lifting heavy weights, thinking that I'm just so cool. And I'm like, man, nothing beats this. Then Sunday morning rolls around and I get to go and hear them sing. And the Lord shows up and spends some time with me. That's happiness. That's joy. That is the best time of my life. Don't forget the times. You're going to get to use football, whatever sport, basketball. I feel like there's a basketball player over here. I don't know why. Maybe not. You're looking at me like, absolutely not. Not a basketball player back there? No? Ah, I knew it. Use it, but don't let that run your life. Because yes, check this out, right? Now I get to do another illustration. Y'all like, this guy's stupid. I don't know what he's saying. So I'm going to show you. Woo! <laughs> All right, so we get to have fun in the ministry. On top of that, and I understand that this one's hard for a lot of people to grasp because they don't want to believe it, every pain gets healed. Every pain. You know, I say even physical pains, yes, not all the time. Sometimes I think he's like, he wants you to hurt so you can help someone else along the way. But I will tell you right now, my depression, gone for the most part until my kids speak sometimes and it's back. <laughs> but other than that like every pain gets healed and and God has and, and he's got total control of your vessel right so why do we walk around all angry and upset like I get it right some people that are no longer of younger ages that's my easiest way to say like you're getting old right 
things hurt. I'm only 30 and I feel like I'm 87, right? Like everything hurts all the time, but I don't show it because when I'm up here, the Lord takes it away. I get to enjoy my time in the spirit. Whenever he takes full control of my vessel, I forget about all the aches and pains, even the aches and pains you're feeling right now listening to me. Guess what? Let him take over and it won't hurt anymore. Amen. That's between you and him, not me and you. But he does. The great I am still is. They sing a song about that. Understand the God that raised people from the dead. Once again, sorry, weightlifting idea and, and analogy here. You don't believe that Jesus was a strong man, right? I already said he moved the first Atlas stone. He also was a power lifter because he was the best deadlifter ever. <laughs> Boom. It clicked. I saw it click. He was like, what does that even mean? Yeah, he raised them from the dead. Yeah, there it goes. But he is. And that's the same God that we get to serve. That same God that fed the 5,000, that same God that allowed Peter to walk on water, that same God that transformed Paul from Saul, that same God that was with David whenever he killed Goliath. Oh, we're only going to talk about Goliath? No, I like the bear and the lion better because no one got to see it, but David still knew it happened. Why? Because that's the God that he served. Same God we serve. Oh, how cool is your God? I'll keep on. Let me continue bragging on him since everyone seems so excited about it. The same one that, you know, uh, took the Red Sea and parted it and people walked across on dry ground. I can't do that. I use this analogy all the time. Could you see me out there in the wilderness, like just holding a stick over the water? I can't do it. Moses couldn't do it, but God can. If you will give him total control, I promise you, y'all might not think they're to the same extent that they were in that day. They are. I know there's a few people in here that I've heard of that have a testimony similar to mine. Amen for what the Lord can do. Amen. This right here is a walking testament of God's miracles to this day. You know how hard it is for people to quit nicotine, let alone methamphetamines, let alone alcohol, let alone marijuana, let alone opiates? Yeah, it's real hard. I did it all at once, but I didn't do anything because God did it. That's the miracles that our Lord and Savior performs. And if that doesn't get you excited, that should get you down to the altar. And that should get you saved because that's what can happen in your life. Amen. That's what we get to do. That's the joy that we see. That was my happy voice. I'm real scared for each one of you. <laughs> we get to see that we get endless joy. Every pain healed. I'll stop talking about it and I'll prove it. Psalm 147, verse 3. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Solved. My last actual point, then I'll give you the conclusion and I'll give you your lives back for a moment. Understand, this right here is also very possible. A lot of people don't believe it. Now, I'm not saying that I have the answer to being rich. I don't, or we would be rich, right? <laughs> but we get endless joy, every pain healed, and enlargement of wealth, health, and wisdom. Jabez had his coast enlarged because he asked for it. There's scripture that says, ye have not because ye ask not. Yeah, it's that simple, everybody. I've been praying to be rich for like the past three months. I'm still not rich. But he's putting things in line to where it could very well be possible. But do you know why? This is where my actual analogy is going to come. Because when the Lord gives, right? This one's not open yet, sorry. I promise I won't make a mess, right? So he's already given you a million blessings, right? Then you start doing for him. All of a sudden, your vessel actually becomes a vessel to be used. And everyone's like, oh, man, that guy's just living the dream. He's obviously eating well. He's, <laughs> he's obviously doing good because his daughters look really pretty, so they've got to pay for that, right? Ha! <laughs> well, that one was for me. But see, he put some in my vessel, but not to keep. He lets us give back. So my thought process on this and this is just how my simple mind works right that vessel was just cracked open this vessel used to be trash but this trashy vessel just helped fill this pretty one Amen. hmm 
So does that mean that someone that was once deemed a piece of trash could reach someone, say, I don't know, like the president? Could reach someone like, I don't know, Donald Trump? And I don't mean as far as his salvation, but for him to understand that you can be happy. Right? He did not seem very happy most of the time. I don't know. He fires everyone. I don't. It's crazy. You're "You're fired. Okay, I didn't even do anything. Bet. But this is one of my favorite things that you'll hear. Like, I want to have this illustration, but it's hard to carry this much stuff around in a minivan with seven people and all their luggage. But I really want to have a full picture up here with me so I can just show you how good God is and that you'll never outgive him. Because the more that you start filling someone else up with his blessings, the more he'll put on you until you are both overflowing with his blessings. And then guess what you do? You keep pouring it out to other people and you get to see the growth of it. We get to see people, like I've mentioned earlier, we get to see Paul. Paul went from literally condemning and murdering Christians. I promise y'all it sounds horrible, right? Read the Bible, it really did happen. To getting saved and being able to pour out to some of the weirdest people you'll ever meet. Like he was always arrested or getting in trouble for something, but someone always got saved. I promise you it was not because Paul walked around and was like, I can't believe I'm in jail today. Who would do this? He realized that every moment in his life was a reason. And that there's someone there that needed to hear about just how good Jesus is. Every time you get to step on a field, a weight room, every time y'all get to go to any other church, I don't know if y'all go to other churches, but if you do, if you you do, pour your, your energy Oh my goodness. I, I was like literally about to start working out in, the, in his basement yesterday after talking to you. I'd already worked out. Your energy came through the phone and lit me up. I was like, yeah! But that's because you're not afraid to pour joy out. You're not afraid to let others reap from what you've reaped from. You don't take your, your seeds sown and watch them flourish and then you reap and then you, no, nah, this is mine. You don't. You pour it out on every single person in here. You know how I can tell you that happens? Yeah, I can tell you and I'll show you because you all said hello to me and you were all extremely nice. Yeah, you're like, well, that's how all Christians are. No, it is not, my friends. Some Christians are really mean. It's super sketchy. I don't get it. I'm like, didn't we both get saved at one point in time? I don't, why are you so angry? Do you need a hug? (laughs) And usually they say yes, because no one wants to deny a hug from me. (laughs) I will force, will I not? I will force a hug on you if you do not hug me. So there's that little tidbit. Be ready for hugs. You won't. You will never in a million years outgive God. You can't. Psalm 115 verse 14. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. Mm. I know a lot of times I'm not going to get to see the fruit from the seeds that are sown. But I thank God every single day that there's five children that will get to one day. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait to see what the Lord's got in store for their lives. I can't wait to see what the Lord's got in store for you. I don't know if you all have realized yet, I love young people. You know why? Because y'all are the next generation. Sitting here in 14 people, young folk. (laughs) They're smaller than y'all, 13, sorry. It's crazy. One of y'all might be a missionary. One of y'all might be a preacher. I don't know the calling on your life. You are the next generation. Keep the happiness going, keep it flowing, and enjoy your time in church. I don't know if y'all have heard me this entire message literally in my notes. If you want a copy, I'll show you. 98% of it says stop being miserable in the ministry. Amen. Churches aren't dying because the gospel's dying. Right. Churches are dying because everybody is miserable. Right. I, look, I told y'all I was blunt from the beginning. And I'm not going to stop being blunt. I cannot help it. I've tried. And if I try and not be blunt, things get real butchered. There's no greater life 
than serving the Lord. Amen. I want to point out, on top of the many different great things salvation does for you, just like I just told y'all, there's so many other benefits to serving Him. This one right here is probably one of my favorites. I kind of said it earlier. Something else happens to your soul after you get saved. I don't like using the analogy during this illustration because if I seal it and I'm like, you can never open it, and then I take the lid off and start pouring blessings out, people are like, I thought you couldn't unseal it. So, right, it doesn't work out. But you are sealed in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Your soul, you know, back in the days when people actually used to send letters, you know, you had to write things. It's crazy. They don't even teach kids that anymore. It's like three letters is 17 words. I don't get it. But back in the really old days, they would take wax. Everyone had a ring. They would dip it in the wax, and they would seal the back of that envelope. That same thing happens to your soul when you get saved. The only difference between that weird ring wax seal and God's seal is God's can't be broken. I like to use the analogy of your name's welded down forever. You can't get it off. It's so great being able to live for him. Last scripture, and then I'm done, preacher. Isaiah 64, 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Amen. There's a song that I think you all sing, actually. I don't know. Do you all sing it? I'm not asking you to sing it. Do you sing the song about the potter and the clay? They don't sing the song. There's a song about the potter and the clay. Hallelujah. I love it. Jesus was and still is number one in recycling in the entire universe. Now I want to ask a question to every single person lost or saved. Usually just for the lost. Like I said, I got saved out of the same scripture. He probably preached it better than I did. Hallelujah. But if you're lost, will you bring your unrecycled bottle to the Lord tonight? If you're saved... Will you bring your recycled bottle to the Lord tonight? Let him pour some in so that you can pour some out. I'm a firm believer that there's a possibility that you can make it to the NFL. That's who I am. I believe anyone can make it. I do. I've got that kind of heart. There's a reason the Lord would allow it. The only reason I'm looking at him, guys, is because he's the only one that I know play football. So understand, if you make it, that's because God's got a plan for that money. Never forget who gave you that ability. That's why you see a lot of players get it taken away. I truly do believe. But if you don't make it, don't get discouraged. Keep coming down to the altar and bringing that vessel to God. Let him do with it what he has planned for your vessel, not what we have planned for our vessels. And watch him grow and flourish. There's no reason that an addict from Clovis, New Mexico should be planting a church right now. But he is because my vessel's been recycled. Thank you, preacher. Hello, Pastor Randy Dignan here of Bible Baptist Church in Jefferson City, Missouri. I'm going to take a moment and express to you what our main vision and purpose is of this ministry. You see, much of this world today has a question. It's a question that was asked in John chapter 3 by one person. It's a question that is asked by the masses, but when you really think about it, it's really a question we all have to come to grips with, face to face with, one on one in our lives, sometime in our life. The question is this, where will I spend eternity? And that question was asked by a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He approached Jesus Christ in the middle of the night and had a question about spiritual matters. Well, good thing for Nicodemus, he came to the right person at the right time because Jesus Christ is the answer in spiritual matters. You see, many of us have questions about that, and man has tried in many of its efforts to answer that question with their own ideas and philosophies. We've tried to come up with ideas on how to get us to heaven, how to confirm our way to heaven. But the fact is, we've got to find out what God says about eternal things. And that's why asking Jesus Christ that question is so vital. Because when you ask Jesus a question, you get the answer. And as the question was asked, Jesus answered simply this. Ye must be born again. In John chapter 3, that's what he said to Nicodemus, and that's the same thing he says to you and to me, even today. You see, God is God of this universe, but he's not everybody's father. What does that have to do with John chapter 3? Well, think about this. We all have birthdays. We all are physically born under this physical planet. 
or else you wouldn't be able to watch me or I wouldn't be able to sign to you right now or talk to you at this time. But God, being a spiritual being, knew that though our bodies are temporal, our spiritual part of us, our spiritual anatomy of us, is an eternal thing. And so God says, I'm more concerned about the spiritual issues. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and me 2,000 years ago and live again three days later so that you and I can have a spiritual birthday and know for sure that heaven is our home. Well, that leads to the next question. Why do we need a spiritual birthday? Well, it's simple. We're all sinners. We've all broken God's law and God's commands. But God loves us so much so that he let Jesus Christ become the substitute for your sin and my sin. So that if we recognize and admit that we are sinners, we can then trust in Jesus Christ as our substitute. And more so than that, our personal Savior and know that on top of our physical birthdays, we have a spiritual birthday now in that God becomes our father, we become his sons, daughters, we become his children, and we know we're going to go to heaven someday. My friend, it's very simple. It's not about what the church says or what I have ideas about or what you have ideas about. It's finding out what God says directly to you and me. And he did it right there in the Bible, and in particular, John chapter 3, when Jesus says, you must be born again. If our church can help you with that question, if you have any questions about that, we can give you some answers. We'd be glad to help you in any way we can. Again, Pastor Randy, personally thanking you for watching the message. And again, if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. God bless and make it a great day.